Good morning, students. I guess I guess we're going to get a little bit warmer, but we're still having the cool weather, which is which is fine. Uh, I always take a few days to adjust to the to the change in weather with my Dr. Phil head, so that that's just part of what I go through. But I hope you're uh, staying well. Um, be, be sure to watch what you eat. You know, this time of year, there are lots of stomach bugs that go around and, and you know, take care of yourself and be picky about, you know, not eating things that are questionable and drink plenty of water. Uh, that, that will help uh, flush your system and, and keep you healthier. I'm a, you see during lecture, I'm always drinking water because it, it, it really is that what they call it, the universal solvent, it, it keeps us healthy. So keep that in mind as, as you're working through uh, the end of the term. What we wanna to do today is to complete some of the uh, discussion uh, that I mentioned about tangent lines at the pole, and then talk about uh, some further calculus topics uh, with the polar coordinates. And then of course, uh, we will have one lecture next week. I will put up the announcement about the final exam uh, where I will just maybe uh, go over some of the uh, practice examples uh, that we have on the practice test, just to give you uh, uh, an overall comprehensive view of, of what we've done. Uh, you may find that helpful or, or not. Again, I, every student has something that they usually need to review uh, before you head into the final. But as I tell all of my students, make sure you focus on the new material and then go back to old material and review uh, as you need to do. So, so keep, keep the uh, engines running and, and know that by next week, you'll have a, a huge break in your life when you're, when you're done with your uh, sand jack courses and especially your Cal 2 course. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Now, um, like I said before, we had, there was a topic that I mentioned uh, last lecture that I really didn't have time to talk about and I didn't want to just rush through it. So what we want to do is Dr. Larson mentions this in his uh, text and it's an interesting topic. And what we know is that when we talk about the pole for polar coordinates, we're talking about the origin. And so, if we were interested, like when we looked at the lemniscuit, we saw at the pole that there were all kinds of uh, issues at the, uh, at the pole with, with derivatives that didn't exist because there were kinks in the, in the curve. And that was, that was a big mess. But in instances, like if we have a rose curve where you have a nice smooth transition at the pole, it makes sense to talk about you know, the equation of a tangent line. So, so I want to address that now, and it turns out to be extremely simple. Uh, there, there are things about polar coordinates that are, that are refreshingly easy uh, that, that we need to take advantage of. So let's just remind ourselves what we had uh, at the last class. For instance, if we have some curve, remember we have R of theta, which is our function of theta. And so when we think of this as parametric equations, we use the equations x equal r cosine theta, y equal r sine theta, as we discussed last class. And so we're going we're gonna to do this, just like I said. We're going to say, OK, maybe we have a value of theta, which is alpha, where we get uh, a point at the pole, 0, 0, so to speak. Um, I'll talk more about poles because curves do crazy things at poles. They'll, they'll hit the intersection at different angles. And so we just call the, the pole zero, zero, just to avoid all of the complication. So if this is the case, let's go ahead to the Cartesian derivative and, and figure out what the slope would be. That is, what's the Cartesian slope at the pole if we have this? And of course, we're gonna have to, if you look here, we, we're gonna need r prime of theta to be non-zero. We need smoothness. So again, we're gonna have to have this if this is gonna make any sense with the lemniscuit that all went out the window. So now what we do is we just replace theta with alpha. 
So we have R prime of alpha sine of alpha plus R of alpha cosine of alpha. So this is just using the uh, Cartesian derivative that we derived last class, nothing new. And then we have R prime of alpha cosine alpha plus, oh, excuse me, minus, I'm gonna need a new, new wide out. I, I think I keep Amazon in business with wide out. And then R alpha sine alpha. Now, of course, the assumption was that R of alpha is zero. That is, we're at the pole. So these two terms, are zero, so this is zero because R alpha is zero, and so is this term. And then of course you see that we need the R prime alpha to be non-zero. So now all that's left are these two terms, and then of course the R prime of alphas, they absorb and we're left with sine alpha over cosine alpha. But now this is just tangent of alpha. So they, basically the tangent of alpha at the pole is just the polar coordinate definition of the angle. That is, this is the rise over run. So, so how nice. This corresponds to the polar definition of angle. So therefore, well, and this is what I was talking about. It's so simple. Therefore, the tangent lines at the pole are just this R theta equal alpha, where R of alpha equals zero and R prime of alpha is non-zero. So, so the, this is the first time if we do this work, what we see is that all we have to really do is, is look for this. Once we have this, then we can automatically go to the line because the lines in polar coordinates are just theta equal constant. So of course the R is uh, uh, free. And so you, 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 get the, uh, you get a line that is the geometric uh, uh, manifestation of theta equal a constant is a line. So, so again, sometimes when you look at these calculations, you get things that are surprising, but then not surprising. So, so this is a simplification here that I find to be very interesting and something that, like I said before, uh, you need to be aware of as you do your physics and you do your engineering. Uh, a lot of these ideas. Uh, just get pushed away and, and, and you need to be able to think about these and and because otherwise you scratch your head and say, I don't know why this is doing this. I mean, I need to uncover the idea. So what I had here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of a rose curve that has a nice uh, condition at the uh, at the pole. So here's an example of this. We have R equals six cosine three theta. This is the rose curve. If you look at your uh, sheet of polar graphs, the rose curve, again, where we have R equal A cosine N theta. So in this particular case, we have the N equal three, Okay, so that means we're gonna have three petals and have something that looks like this. Again, using the Cartesian graph to get the uh, polar graph as we've done. We see that's a nice simplification to uh, make a nice transition from Cartesian uh, to polar. So what we want to do is compute, compute tangent lines at the pole. So this doesn't have to be difficult. And of course, now with our little computation here, we know we just look for zeros. And of course, now let's just go ahead and write this down. 
we want to do uh, R prime. So this will be, let's see, we've got a six, and then we have the derivative of cosine will be negative sine three theta times the three by the chain rule. So this gives us a negative 18 sine three theta. Okay, so we need to, all we have to do is check what we have here. And, and, and if these are satisfied, we get tangent lines at the poles. And, and that's, that's nice. Okay, so, so now this will imply, so if and only if, R equals zero. So we're again applying this part or what's in the red box. So this will be here. This will just say, well, the six doesn't matter. So this basically just says cosine three theta equals zero. So we get to do some more trigonometry. So we have three theta is equal to the inverse cosine of zero. Now we can extend this to all solutions, but of course, back our at our first day, we used the inverse uh, cosine, or at least we alluded to it. And, and we know that the inverse cosine of zero is pi over two, uh, since the range of the inverse cosine runs from zero to pi. So now we can think, well, we wanna make sure we get everything because we have this coefficient of three here. So that's gonna make the period smaller. So hopefully give us more uh, bang for the buck, so to speak, more output. So, so let's go ahead and extend this. We see that we get zero at the odd multiples of pi over two. That is uh, the positive uh, axis or the polar axis pi over two and the polar axis three pi over two. So we can say three theta equals pi over two times 2k plus one, where k is an integer. It's like when you do do induction in pre-cal, do you, do you change the in, or ends to Ks when you're doing the induction step? And, and that's always funny because the students think, well, why do you do that? I said, well, the author does it and I don't want you to feel like you're being left out. So, so again, if you wanna use an N here, that's fine. I, it, it doesn't matter. So now theta divide by three will be pi over six, 2K plus one. Now in this particular example, uh, WebAssign says, look for tangents at the pole so we don't write down infinitely many uh, where we have uh, theta between zero and pi. Okay, so again, we follow the formatting because you know, for instance, sometimes WebAssign will say, well, uh, give us a value of R that's positive and give us a value of R that's negative. Uh, so, so, or say, list the, list the, uh, polar coordinates with the least r first and the greater r second. And if the r's are the same in absolute value, you have to impose a negative with the identity. So the formatting is really just a way of helping you to, to understand uh, all the bits and pieces of the polar coordinates. So that's a, that's a good uh, educational tool. So now if we look at this, we can go ahead and run through some of these, that is when k equals zero, we'll get a pi over six. k equals one, we get pi over six uh, times a three, which will give us what, a pi over two. Just like, you know, when you list all the possible solutions in a particular interval. And then let's, well, we can keep going. Let's try a k equal uh, to two. So we get pi over six times a five, which is five pi over six. And then of course, if we go to a three, uh, then we get a seven and, and, and that's, that's too big. So, so uh, for instance here, that would be uh, bigger than pi, seven pi over six. So this is where we stop. Now what we can do is look here. Remember we need this condition. So we'll just write this in red. And we'll say r prime of pi over six. Well, of course, this is going to be a three pi times this. That'll give us a pi over two. And of course, sine of pi over two is one. So this is non-zero. So that's a check. Again, we just verify. We don't necessarily have to write down an answer. We just need to make sure it's not zero. And then r prime 
of pi over two. Again, with the uh, three here, that'll give us three pi over two. Sine of three pi over two is negative one. Again, non-zero. And then for the last one, five pi over six. Now, when we multiply by three, that'll give us a five pi over two. Again, the sine of five pi over two is one, making this uh, what non-zero again. So these are all checks. So when we do this, this computation, uh, we, we check for this, and then of course we verify this. It's kind of like, you know, I, I'm going back to induction. Remember, you can do an algebraic proof about natural numbers, and, and then you do a verification with induction, or maybe you didn't have algebra to do, and you didn't derive anything, and you're just, just proving by induction. Induction, after you do an algebraic proof, is like checking your solution. Um, sometimes if we do divisibility arguments with induction, or like we're trying to show that a, a particular sequence is monotonic, we, we, we go through the induction process so it, it verifies things. That is, we can't check infinitely many cases. We can say, well, it looks like this is a pattern. So, so when, we, when we do uh, topics like this, this is an inductive argument. When we write down all the solutions here, uh, we're using the, uh, the uh, periodicity of the cosine and the sine function. So everything, everything comes together. That is, hopefully calculus two is making you feel a whole lot better about what you did prior to this class, that it was important. So now, now we, we're, we're done. So we say tangent lines, tangent lines at the pole. Will now be, we'll just write, use this. So here, here are the alphas, so to speak. So we have uh, theta equal pi over six, theta equal pi over two, and theta equal five pi over six. So, so the, nice, the nice thing about this is that when you have these conditions, it, it's not really hard to check and, and, and you don't have to go through all of the, the difficulty of like when we're in a Cartesian setting and we've got horrible numbers and then we've got to substitute the, the point and then the slope and work through all the tragic square roots as we've seen in previous examples. This is actually quite simple. And, and it's simple if you make this observation here about uh, the uh, slope of the particular uh, curve at the pole, very simple. So, so again, that's a plus and we, we, we'll take what we can get, right? So when it comes to uh, doing um, calculus, usually what we find is that the difficulty in doing our work is contingent on how many uh, uh, observations we compile that make our work easier. Now, I'm a big fan of efficiency. And I don't like to have to do more work than required. But we don't want to shortchange the work uh, and, and not really cover all the bases. So that's kind of what we have to do when we learn math. And, and then as we get more experienced, uh, we can cut to the chase a little bit quicker. Now, some of the calculus things with the polar coordinates will have to do with area, uh, arc length, and the surface area. So we want to make that uh, transition uh, to the calculus that we did for the standard parametric in 10.3, and now do the same thing with the polar coordinate transformation as a, as a specific idea. So this will be 10.5, calculus of polar coordinates. So what we can do, if you look at your, your notes, I'm always rewriting notes, but the notes that I posted, we can, we can think of a, a situation where we have a, a, a polar graph
And so I use, sometimes I say R equals F of theta, but sometimes I get lazy and just say R equal R of theta. Well, I have extra letters. I, I, Dr. Larson's book is, is, is a masterpiece, but, but, but sometimes I think he uses extra letters to ho hopefully keep things uh, clear, but, but sometimes it, it gets a little bit cluttered. But who am I to, to criticize? It's just an observation. Uh, he, he has a successful book and, and I'm grateful uh, for his industry and in providing the, the students of, of our world with, with an excellent calculus book. So, so when I look at this, for instance, if we have a non-zero or non-negative um, function of theta, where maybe we have some radial lines. So we'll say uh, in this case uh, on, I think in my notes, I say alpha beta, where we don't go past two pi in difference. So we might have something like this zero beta minus alpha less than two pi. So we stay in the unit circle uh, uh, interval, so to speak. So for instance, say we have some type of curve, maybe that's you know one of the uh, polar curves that we have, it's got several humps in it. So I was, took a little bit of liberty there. And so we're just going to think about area in terms of circular sectors. So say we have a radial line, say here theta is equal to alpha, and then another one here, theta is equal to beta. And so we might, in, in this polar, polar sense, so here's the pole, here's the uh, polar axis, and here's the pi over two axis, the pi axis, et cetera. And so we might be interested in determining this particular uh, area with the polar graph. So what we would do is just like we've done before, and I know, I know sometimes this is dry, we haven't done this in a while, but let's just go through it. So what we want to do is partition, partition the interval alpha to beta. So we'll just call it big delta, upper uppercase delta. And so we'll do, and normally what we do is we say uh, alpha or, or excuse me, alpha, theta sub zero will be alpha. And then we have theta one, theta two. And then we'll just bump up to the i sub interval, i minus one to i. And then of course, this gives us our n minus one points. So theta sub n would be uh, beta. So that's the, that's the old hat. That's what we did a million times in chapter seven. And I'm sure you're not so excited about seeing this. So, so the thing is, is that we could think of that in this case, focusing here, So this small little piece here. Now, again, in the limit as the partition of the norm here goes to zero, that is, or excuse me, the norm of the partition goes to zero, then these little uh, areas here approximate sectors of circles because they get so tiny, you can, you can use an approximation of area uh, based upon the sector area of a circle. And so that's how we kind of formulate this in a geometric way. So for instance, now let, if you like, theta, and I'll say, I think I wrote this theta sub i with a little star here to be the point that we pick in the i sub interval. Remember with the Riemann sum, all we have to do is pick an element in the uh, sub interval. And of course, in Cal 1, we would pick the left end point or the right end point to keep from going crazy with the Riemann sums, but, but now it really doesn't matter. And so what we want to do is write the Riemann sum. Let me use a capital and spell it correctly. 
write the Riemann sum of the sector areas and let the norm of the partition, sometimes I'll just say n goes to infinity, but of course we know really the more general setting is that the, the largest subinterval here goes to zero. Otherwise, you know, if we don't have the right kind of partition, n going to infinity could just blow up in our faces. So this implies that the area that we're interested in here, the, the, the pencil shaded area, will be the limit as the norm passes to zero here of i equal one to infinity or into n. So, and of course, as, as the norm passes to zero, this becomes infinite. And so with the sector area will be one half r of theta sub i star quantity squared delta theta sub i. So again, the area of the sector is one half r squared theta. And so in the, in the limit, again, the delta theta becomes our d theta. And then of course, this becomes our integrand. And then of course, the limits of integration are based upon the interval that we partition. So this defines the Riemann integral when the limit exists. And so we get one half alpha to beta r squared. And so if you like, you can just, just do, do the kind of the lazy notation, r squared d theta. So most students really like this because this is a very, very simple. So we'll just say polar area. Very simple formula. So I have a I have an example that that I drew uh, from from the ebook. I had one in the notes that's fine, but there was a there was a, I was looking through the ebook and I saw an example that was relatively interesting. And I thought, well, we did a we did a lemma sign with an inner loop, and so I just sketched this out as an additional example. And so I want to do that applying uh, this formula. Now, here's an example. And let me just go ahead and, and get an extra sheet of paper so we have plenty of room. So for instance, here, uh, I want to do an example where we compute, compute area of the inner loop. And this would be of the limason. So remember the limason are these forms here, here where the A over B is less than one. So this example we did last class. So I picked another one to do. And in this case, uh, we've got the curve R equals one minus two sine theta. I'll set these up so that you get nice uh, limits of integration. I, I, you know, you can, you can use inverse trig functions to get any limit of integration, but I'll make sure that they, they're, they're nice numbers, at least numbers that you can compute with the unit circle. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, let's just draw our Cartesian graph. The best thing to do is get, get a visual of this uh, so you can, think about limits. So, of course, we're going to do the cheap approach because we're lazy. Now, when you look at this and you think about what we have here, um, we can just do the principal point zero pi over two pi three pi over two because the period's just two pi and then 2 pi here. Now, notice we've got this negative here, and I'm going to mark this off 1, 2, 3, and then, well, let me not make that too, too close, give the scale a little bit better. 1, 
2. So this would be negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, like that. So at 0, of course, we'll get 1. And then at pi over 2, we've got 1 here. So that's a 1 minus a 2. So that puts us at negative 1. And then, of course, at pi, that's, that's a 0 term. So we back to 1. And then at uh, 3 pi over 2, this is a negative 1. So we get the minus minus. So we end up at, with a 3 here. And then, of course, at 2 pi, this is a 0 term. And we're back to 1. So that's the, that's the cheap way to do the trig graph when you're experienced. Uh, we, in pre-cal, I, I give them the transformations. Um, but, but once you're better at this, you can focus on the principal points. And again, uh, I always tell my students, as you evolve in trig, you, you can cut to the chase a little bit quicker. So when we look at this, we think of a curve that looks something like this. So we've got something like this. And this, of course, is going up this way, but that's all we're going to look at. So now, now notice with this, we can draw our uh, curve, polar curve. So now we start out at one. Remember, it's always good to just kind of mark in some easy values of R right there. So here we get, we'll do, we'll do like a one and we have a one. So we start out at angle zero, one. And then at this particular point here, this is where we're going to get the inner loop right here. So those are zeros here. So let's just look at that. Let's go ahead and compute that because those are going to give us the limits because the inner loop is going to be right here. So we have r equals zero. So r equals zero. Go ahead and kill two birds with one stone. If and only if, uh, what is it? Uh, two sine theta equals one. So sine theta equals one half. So this is going to give us theta is equal to the inverse sine of one half, which is pi over six. Now, if we if we look at this and we think we think about how things are moving along and running through here, we're like, OK, so we've got a zero here. And then by Professor Ron's lemma, we know that the sine function is not one to one on uh, zero to pi. That's the kink in the sine function. So the other uh, zero will just be pi minus this zero. So by Professor Ron's limit, we'll get another zero. Alpha will be pi minus pi over six, which is five pi over six. So really, we can go in here. Well, let me use another color, forgive me. Uh, we got pi over six here and five pi over six here. But of course, we're going to be lazy because we've got symmetry. This is symmetric about pi over two, so we could just double the result integrating from here to here. Again, just you know, take advantage of symmetry. So now when we when we think about this, we've got like a, you know, the pi over six, five pi over six, those radial lines. So we come in here and then we form the loop. That is, this is the pi over two, but this is negative. So we hit the one down here by reversing or shooting through the origin. So we get our loop here, our symmetric loop. Yeah, that's not very symmetric, is it? Sorry. All right. And now, of course, we move back around to pi. So we touch at five pi over six and get something like this. Nice, nice symmetric curve here. And then the rest is easy. We move down to three pi over two. So we've got three. So we get here and then symmetry back up to two pi. So this Cartesian strategy 
is really very useful to us. Nice, 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 well-behaved curve. Okay, so now we can see that if we want the area of the inner loop, we just want this. So we can use these limits to get the area of the inner loop with the radial lines running this way, but use symmetry. So basically cut it in half. So we'll say, let theta live between pi over six and pi over two and double the result. So again, we can take here and then of course here. So we've got theta equal pi over two and theta equal pi over six as radial line. Sorry, pi over six there. Okay. And let me make sure you can see that. All right. So again, uh, with the always getting extra ink all over the place, forgive me. And then I put ink all over the rest of the pages. So let me clean that up a little bit. Okay, these nice these nice markers are good, but once you get inked, they, they cover all of your work. So now, now we can go back, ladies and gentlemen, to this right here. Okay. So we'll use this formula and we'll double it. So area of inner loop. Again, these are not hard calculations, but now we're using the new objects with the polar coordinates. And so we just have to be a little bit more vigilant. So now notice here, we'll have, we're gonna do two, we're gonna double the result. And then of course we have the formula one half and then the limits. So we have one half from the formula and then alpha to beta pi over six pi over two to cover half of it and then double. And then we have R, which is one minus two sine theta quantity squared d theta. And this is just a plain old Cal one, Cal two integral from the trig integrals, which we can easily do. So, so now again, just right here, formula, formula for polar area. All right, so at least the new stuff is entertaining. It's, it's fun as we, as we say. So now let's go ahead and compute. So of course that's just a one. So we have pi over six, pi over two. And then we just uh, expand this. So this will give us a one, I hit this with a two. So four sine theta, and then uh, plus a four sine squared. So we'll use the power reducing identity like you learn in pre-cal. No need to kill it with a reduction formula from the integration by parts. That's just, that's too hard. We always go back to what we like when it's easy. So now uh, let's do this. So let's go ahead and see what we can do to um, uh, reduce the integrand before we integrate or anti-differentiate. So this will be one minus four sine theta. And then of course, this will be the one half. So plus four over two, sorry, I have something in my eye. And this will be what? One minus cosine two theta using the reduction formula. So again, sine squared theta is one minus cosine two theta over two. That's the reduction formula that I've used here. So now this will give us pi over six to pi over two. So we have one minus four sine theta. And then of course now here, we have a, a two times a one, so plus two. 
And then of course here, a two here. So this will be a minus two cosine two theta. So this will give us the integral pi over six, pi over two, add the one and the two, give us a three. The other example was easier, but I thought this was an interesting example. So that's why I chose to do it. Uh, and then minus two cosine two theta. Now we can easily take an antiderivative. So now notice here, we'll just get a three theta. And here the antiderivative of sine is cosine. So that gives us a negative four cosine. Oh, well the anti, excuse me, the antiderivative of sine is the negative cosine. <sighs> Professor Ron, let me write this up here every time I foul up something. So let's just see the antiderivative of sine is the opposite of the derivatives. So I'll make a little list of things I'm using. So of course that'll be uh, minus minus. So I get a plus there. I was checking my computation earlier. Yes, very good. And then of course here, let me just go ahead and write this one in. The cosine theta is the opposite of the derivative is sine. So there's another one. So these are all little tidbits you need to have on your formula cards just to make sure you have these correct. And so here um, we've got, uh, let's see what, four uh, cosine theta. And then here, when we take the antiderivative, we'll have the, uh, the positive sine, but the one half from the chain rule will give us a minus sine two theta. So here, with this part, just remember when we make this table ready, uh, we need the two theta or two d theta and pay for it with the one half, which will absorb the two and just leave us the negative one. Okay, so now this will be pi over six to pi over two. So again, here, chain rule. So now we can easily evaluate this. Let's substitute uh, pi over three. So we have three pi over two plus, well now of course, th this would just be plus four cosine pi over two minus sine. Okay, if we pi over two, of course the two's absorbed, it gives us sine of pi. And now pi over six, so we get three pi over six, and then plus four cosine pi over six, and then minus sine. And at this point we have a two, so that's gonna be a pi over two pi over six or pi over three. Okay, so lots of non-zero terms. So now what does this give us? And I'll give a little bit more room here. So this is a good, this is a good review example. It covers all the bases. That's why I did it. Gives you some nice review of integration with the trig integrals. It gives you nice work with trigonometry, polar graphs, everything kind of a combo problem. So here we get three pi over two. And if you like, this is just, uh, I'll go ahead and put this together, a minus three pi over six, just put those together because we're gonna need to combine this one and this one. And then of course, cosine of pi over two is zero. So that's plus zero. And then of course, minus sine of pi, sine of pi is zero. So these two terms equal zero. So this is zero and this is zero. So that's nice. Okay, so minus, and now here we have minus four, and then of course, cosine of pi over six is root three over two. So we've got this and then minus minus. So we get plus here, uh, sine of pi over three, which is root three over two. 
So now a common denominator of six. So let's see, that's going to be a nine pi minus three pi. And then of course here that we've got what negative three copies of uh, in this case uh, root three over two, right? So minus three root three over two, just adding these two, same denominator. So we've got this covered. And then of course here, this will be six pi over six. So that gives us pi minus three root three over two. Now, like I said before, um, <laughs> I woke up this morning and I, here's, here's what I scratched out. I said extra. So, so I think of a problem when I'm sleeping and then I check your ebook and think, would this be a good example? And of course, this was an example that, that was, was in the ebook just like this. But of course, my approach is different because I, I teach differently from the author of the book, but that's all good. So, so when you're working examples, um, my philosophy is, is that if you, if you cover several bases in an example, you, you basically covered uh, many ideas that you need to review. So even though these are simple, uh, we, we get away from simple things and have to remind ourselves. So we're always checking, you know, is, is this sign correct? This reduction formula, is it correct? And so, so this is a nice review example, but now you can see that the actual formula for the polar area, again, is quadratic based upon the sector area of a circle. So, you know, we're doing the same things that we, we've been doing uh, when we were in pre-cal. Okay, so now, all these papers here. So now let's look at an example where we extend arc length. Yeah, let's do arc length. So we have formulas for arc length with parametric, right? So now we want the specific. Now you're thinking, why, why, does, why does Dr. Larson and why did calculus text treat the polar coordinates as so special? Well, they are special because they come up a lot. So it's kind of like we do the general argument and then we, we have a special section that just focuses on a particular type of parametric setup. And, and so think of polar coordinates as being fairly important. So now what we want is arc length, arc length for the polar coordinate transformation. And what I've tried to do is pick some examples with the uh, integrals that give us nice review, that keep, a, keep track of signs, keep track of, of, of absolute values. So, so even though they're a little bit painful, they're good review examples. So arc length for polar coordinate transformation. So, Again, what we do, I won't have to do, we're not doing the Cartesian derivative this time because we already know the formula, we've already been there. So I'll write the X first. So again, R is a differentiable function of theta. And then of course the parametric equations will be X equal R cosine theta and R sine theta. So now remember when we did our parametric uh, derivation, at least came up with the definition, we're going to need x prime under the radical x prime squared plus y prime squared. So we learned that s, say a to b, would be the principal square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared. Say these were x of t, y of t, dt, something like that and whatever letters you wanna use, I guess it doesn't really matter. So that's what we derived for the general scenario of parametric equations. And that's important because this is very useful on tests and final exams. But with, par with the parametric situation with polar, we just go ahead and decide to write out a formula that, that just works with this coordinate system. So let's see what we get. So first, let's go ahead and write these down, um, x prime, will be what? 
R prime, we've done this before, but let's just do it again. Cosine theta minus R sine theta, again, by the product rule, Y prime will be R prime sine theta plus R cosine theta. So now we can just fill these in. So this will be R prime cosine theta minus R sine theta quantity squared plus R prime sine theta plus R cosine theta quantity squared. So again, this part we've seen before, so we keep coming back to it. And now we just square the binomial. So this will be R prime squared. We'll do it this way instead of not putting a T right by the, the dash or the tick mark that looked like a 12. So we'll write it this way, uh, cosine squared minus two R prime R cosine theta sine theta plus R squared sine squared. Very simple. I mean, we, simple is good. And then R prime squared sine squared and then plus two R prime R uh, sine theta cosine theta. And then plus <clears throat> R squared cosine squared theta. So of course, the hazardous terms absorb, which is nice. <clears throat> I told my pre-cal kids I might have time to do rotation of axes and conic sections, but I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm gonna have time. Uh, we're just busy trying to get through all the work. And so they'll probably be happy for me to leave that out because uh, that reminds me of the types of equations you get. Rotation of axes, if you've never done it, you should investigate it. If you look at it through uh, linear uh, algebra transformations, it's it's doable with with quadratic forms. But 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 it, however you look at it, it's it's a it's an elegant uh, uh, situation. Uh, the more the more stuff you throw into it, the more elevated, the easier it looks. So uh, when you do it in pre-cal, it's a little bit painful. So now these absorb, and notice here we we can put these two together. So we have R prime squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And then we can do the same for these two plus R squared times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. So lots of trigonometry, right? That's all it looks like we're doing is pre-cal all over again. So we get what, I guess if you like, and, and I think the way I wrote this, you can write the R squared first. I think it's customary to do that first because of course these are both one plus this, R prime squared. So this implies that arc length now, and of course, I, I guess we'll do alpha to beta since that's what we use for uh, in general for uh, radial lines, if you like, or theta and phi, doesn't matter. Uh, and then uh, in this particular case, we have the what principal square root. So R squared plus R prime squared square root D theta. So this is the arc length in, for, for polar coordinates. So, uh, not, I mean, and, and if you think about it, if, if you think about the situation here, um, ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to have to do this every time. So, so there's, there's a reason for this. It's like having uh, certain formulas for spherical and, and cylindrical coordinate systems. Uh, this, this would be a little bit painful to write down every time. So, so you're glad that you go ahead and do this just like the polar area formula. You don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. You don't rederive the quadratic formula every time you use it. I mean, come on, you know, that that we 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 have to 
make our way a little bit uh, less arduous. So let's let's look at an example of this. So here's an example where uh, the Limassons make really good examples uh, for for these types of computations because they they give you the review of the uh, uh, trig which we all need. So let's compute arc length of a lima sign, and this time we'll do a cardioid that doesn't have an inner loop. So we'll say compute arc length uh, of a lima sign. And in this case, the lima sign is going to be a cardioid in the sense that we get, we get, they sometimes call this the heart shape. This one right here, the heart. So you have the, the, the uh, lack of a derivative here, um, but, but it's the heart shape. So you can use polar coordinates to draw hearts, you know, for Valentine's Day. Well, it's, you know, and it doesn't really look like a heart, but if you turn it over like this, maybe it looks more like a heart. So this was, is when A, a and B are equal. So in this particular case, we're doing R equals one plus sine theta. And then of course, now we have R prime is just cosine theta. So this is where we get to use our uh, algebra and we, we see that we have an improper integral that goes away so we can, we can be a little bit sloppy and, and still get a, a, a finite answer. So now when we look at this, we think about, okay, do we just wanna kind of forge right through it? We wanna make use some symmetry and make it a little bit easier to construct like we did with the area formula. So let's go ahead and do a, a Cartesian and then get a picture of this. And that way we can use symmetry to uh, make our life a little bit easier. Otherwise it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. We don't want that. So again, we have a, uh, uh, period of two pi. So we have zero pi over two pi, three pi over two and two pi. And of course now this is easy to navigate. So we'll do, we'll do one, two. And then of course this is never gonna fall below the axis because of the, the sign and, and, and the one here. I mean, that, that'll just be zero. So at, at zero, we get zero at one, one plus zero. And then at, of course, pi over two, we get one plus one. And then at uh, here, pi, we just get one plus zero. So now, of course, you can cheat a little bit. And of course, at three pi over two, we get zero and then back to two pi. So just like we had before, but shifted, shifted up. Okay, so we have an interesting curve. So now we've got in here, we've got an R here, an R here, R here, we have a zero R and then an R here. We move, I end up moving Professor Ron over. There we go, let me, a little bit, there we go. So now, Let's just see how we can use some symmetry to make some uh, fairly straightforward integrals. And of course, this is not unique. This is just Professor Ron looking at it to use some symmetry to maybe simplify the calculations. So here, uh, we're gonna have, we've got a nice symmetry here from uh, zero uh, to pi. So we'll get a one here and then we grow to two on the uh, polar axis pi over two. So gonna look like the last one, but no inner loop.
And now as we move to pi to three pi over two, the, the radius becomes zero. So we loop in here to form the, the heart. So we're coming in like this, and like that. And that's where we form the cusp. And then we move back out here again, never, never negative. So we're not shooting through the origin I'm right here. So I'm making the heart just a little bit more obvious. So we get the heart shape. Okay, so we don't want to mow over that problem there. So this is the heart. This is the cardioid. Car, I've written it there, but I'll write it again. Cardioid. So if you want to make a Valentine card or something, you can use polar coordinates and impress your friends or, 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 or your sweetheart or whatever. Uh, I don't know. It, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Nate Wiggins, a very smart man, he, he will do fun things like this for his students and, um, and just, just to keep everybody happy. So I, I agree with this. So when we think about this, we have nice symmetry here. So for instance, we could, we could just say, okay, let's just integrate here. For this piece, go from zero to pi or pi over two. So we'll do that integral. And then we've got symmetry here. Again, more symmetry here. And this is, in this case, pi to three pi over two. So we can compute the length of this, add it to the computation of the length of this and double the result. So, so use symmetry. So double each result, double each result. Again, that's just, just my way of looking at it. This is certainly not unique, but it gives us an opportunity to use symmetry, uh, which we all enjoy to some degree. We, we certainly depend on it to make our lives easier. So now what we have to do is compute the element of arc length and then integrate. So let's do that. So here, notice we need um, r squared plus r prime squared. So now let's square it out. So that's going to be cosine. Oh, well, let me start. Let me do that second since I decided to write it in this order. So we have one plus sine squared, a one plus sine quantity squared. And then, of course, r squared. Uh, so r squared we have here. And then, of course, r prime squared will be that squared. I decided to write it this way. Then I wanted to flip it around. How funny. OK, so now we have 1 plus 2 sine theta plus sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta. But of course, this is just equal to one. So we get two plus two sine theta. All right, so now when we look at this, we got to think of the, the square root. So the element of arc length, ds, we take the square root of this. Just notice we can factor the two. Might as well move that out. That was just be in the way. So this will be the square root of two uh, times the square root of one plus sine theta d theta. So that's the element of arc length. So now that would be troublesome without the conjugate method, but we'll be able to survive uh, because the, the issue with the zero in the denominator will go away and in the limit, uh, we, get, we get a convergent improper integral. So we can be sloppy without Folding the actual argument. So that's always a good thing. So now when we do this, we'll say arc length. So we'll do the very first one. And, and here's something you can do when you do this computation. What we're going to do first before we actually, let me just do this first. Before we do this, let's operate, and then I'll do a separate page. Let's operate on this and then see what it looks like in these particular intervals and then move to the integral. That way it'll be simpler. 
So now we have the square root of two square root uh, one plus sine theta. And notice, let's just look at this. Let's just go ahead and fix it. Let's do a conjugate method. Otherwise we can't integrate it. Minus sine theta. Here's our tried and true technique. Now what we're gonna see here is that when we do this, when we look at this particular interval, there's no issue with the sign, but of course we get a zero at pi over two here. But when we integrate and, and actually do the limit, we get, we get a finite number. So this is not gonna fold the calculation. I'm sure you're thinking about that. So this will give us square root two. And now of course we have the square root of one minus sine squared. So I thought doing this computation first would make it easier. And then of course downstairs we have one minus sine theta to the one half. Now of course this is just cosine squared. So we get root two. So the square root of cosine squared is the absolute value of cosine. So that's why I like this problem. It gives, it covers all the bases. And you need to do this first, otherwise you come to grief. <laughs> so sorry about that, but it's the truth. So now we just look for, uh, for this particular interval, the, uh, the cosine that we see here has the non-negative values. So we could say square root two, let me just go ahead and write all this in. So we have square root two cosine theta and then one minus sine theta to the one half when theta lives here. And now of course for this particular uh, uh, interval here, uh, the cosine is, is uh, less than zero. That is, this is in the uh, third quadrant. So now we have square root two times the negative of cosine if we interpret the absolute value. So theta lives here. So this is one of these problems where it's a nice one when you get to the end of the course and you're just using all the techniques you learned before. So now, the only, the only issue here is that this helps us with the differential because the, if, if this is one minus sine theta, now we're gonna be thinking u equals one minus sine theta as a possible substitution. So du, the derivative of sine is just positive sine with a negative. So this is negative cosine theta d theta. So notice here, the negative is taken care of from the absolute value, but here we have to impose it and then put in an extra negative. So, so this is kind of what I was thinking here uh, to set this up initially, and then we can negotiate uh, the absolute value correctly. So when we use the symmetry, we cut down on the work, but then we have to say, okay, we've got this square root and the square root makes the problem harder. So this will give us the uh, calculation uh, uh, ability uh, to move forward. So now when we look at this, we can now actually define uh, the actual integrals. So now this will be S. Now let me do this. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and to spread this out, just get a little extra, extra paper here to have room to move this up. So we've got this and I'll just go ahead and move this up here. And then as we uh, transfer down the page, I won't run out of room. So now S, so we're gonna use the symmetry here for, for this part, we're gonna double it. And notice we don't have the negative for the differential. So we're gonna have uh, negative two, again, two for the symmetry, negative for the differential, 
zero to pi over two. And then we have square root two. And they'll go ahead and bring this upstairs. One minus sine, add one divided by the new power when we do it, negative one half. And then of course we have the negative cosine theta d theta. So I'll move back here. Remember for this part, this is this part, use symmetry, double the square root, the Pythagorean x prime, x prime squared plus y prime squared, or the r squared plus the r prime squared, but we did right here, and then pay for the negative from the differential, okay? That's, the, that's this piece right here, double. And now do the next part plus, so we're gonna double, but notice we already have the negative built in. We don't have to worry about it. So this will be uh, two pi to three pi over two. And so we have square root two, bring the radical upstairs so we can easy to anti-differentiate. And here we have the negative cosine theta d theta, okay? So the key here is that these are both table ready. We had to fix this one because we didn't have the negative here, but this one had the negative due to the absolute value. So that's the important part here. And then after this, this is just add one divided by the new power. So let's move forward. So now, and, and I'll say this, this is the hardest part of the, of the problem. The stuff we've done before is easy, um, but, but the, the analysis here is where you do your calculus. This is, this, is, this is where ability to write mathematics is important and is why I've taught you this way the entire semester. And I will never change the way I teach, even though I may get beaten up for being uh, overly challenging meticulous. As an engineer, as a STEM professional, you have to be able to do this. And so I'm helping you make that great dream of yours come true. So now, now here, add one divided by the new power. So of course we got negative two. Okay, add one, we get one half, right? And then we divide by one half, we get times the two. Life is good, now it's easy. We've done all the dirty work, one half, okay? So add one divided by the new power, zero to power over two. Now here plus, we got the two here. Oh, and uh, man, I get, I get so carried away. Let me shift this over. I need my square root of two. Right there. So we need that square root of two. So again, this comes down, this comes down, and this is from the antiderivative. So this part, antiderivative. I'll just put boxes around that. Let's do the same thing here. Bring this down. I'll go ahead and write the square root of two here. And then we have add one divided by the new power. So we get times the two, one minus sine theta to the one half pi to three pi over two. So here, and then the antiderivative right here. So very simple, but, but again, this is all clouded with new objects that we haven't really worked with much before. And so now we've got what? Negative four times the square root of two. And now we can substitute. So we've got what? One minus sine of pi over two to the one half minus one minus sine of zero to the one half plus here we have a four root two and now substituting we have one minus sine of three pi over two to the one half then minus one move my cursor over, one minus sine 
of pi to the one half close. So just using the fundamental theorem. So we get negative four root two. Now here, of course, the sign of pi over two is one. So we get one minus one. That's just what zero to the one half. That's just a zero. Here we have minus and notice sine of zero is, is zero. So we have the square root of one. So we have minus one to the one half plus four root two. Now, at this point, we're doing the same thing again, but notice the sign of three pi over two, that's the polar axis, that's negative one. So we have minus a one. So we get the square root of two here from this term. And then minus, note here, the sign of pi is zero. So we just get the square root of one. So minus the square root of one. So what does this give us? So we've got negative times a negative. So we have four root two plus four times root two squared minus four root two. Well, of course the four root two is absorbed and of course root two squared is two. So we get four times two or eight. And I'm sure that's a surprising answer for you. It certainly was uh, when I computed it. So the idea here is these calculations are not simple, not because they're overly difficult, but we, we are now seeing that in general, arc length calculations are not easy integrals because of the radical. So when we think about the arc length and polar coordinates, we first want to try to use some symmetry and then make an effort to, to look at the problem from the standpoint of trigonometry. That is, once we look at the actual antiderivative calculation, we think conjugate method, and then we are forced to say, okay, well, this is something we can do because we've got a nice differential and we can interpret the absolute value based upon the intervals of integration. So we get this uh, uh, piecewise defined uh, function here for the antiderivative. So, so again, we break this up into two pieces. Piece one, piece two, that is here, this piece here, this piece here. And so the, the problems are, are, at least from the standpoint of calculation, very simple. But, but the totality of all of the elements that are uh, required uh, can be a little bit daunting just because again, as you move into the calculus, uh, the, the actual uh, computation becomes uh, more tedious, but, but actually very doable. That's why I like this part of the class. It's just a nice culmination of all the interesting things we've been doing. Now, let's look at another example that is, if we think about extending the area formula, a surface of revolution, how's that going to be? Well, it's, that's, this is easy. So let me just give you this. So uh, we write the surface area formula for polar coordinates. That is when we revolve about the polar axis and the theta equal pi over two axis. So area formula for polar coordinates. So let's do this. So number one, so we've got what? R of theta. We already have the arc length formula. So we just have put in the two pi and the distance to the axis of revolution. And just remember, we have x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. So those will be the, the distances to the uh, uh, respective axes uh, to complete the process, just like we did uh, in, in 10.3. So for instance, revolution, revolution about polar axis, 
So this will be S. Again, we have the two pi from the derivation back in chapter seven, and we'll just do alpha to beta as our radial lines. And then the distance to the polar axis will just be the y coordinate or sine theta. And then the element of arc length is r squared, as we've already derived, r prime squared, one half d theta. So again, this is distance to polar axis. The y, so to speak. And then two, revolution, revolution about theta, like the y-axis, theta equal pi over two. So now we'll have area of the surface of revolution, excuse me, so we have two pi alpha to beta, and then we have the distance to the theta equal pi over two axis, which is r cosine theta. And then this gives us r squared plus r prime squared, one half d theta. So this is distance to theta equal pi over two. So the idea here is that we don't have to do anything major, but, but again, when, when you're working with different coordinate systems and, and you find that the simplicity of your model is easier using a particular coordinate system like polar, then it's nice to have all the calculus uh, definitions written in terms of those transformations. So this is kind of nifty if you think, you know, we just keep, doing the same thing over and over, ladies and gentlemen. We just take the same formulas and recast them uh, with new objects. So, so at least math is, is, is repetitive. I mean, I've said this many times, you, to go to the next level, you take what you already know and you add more stuff to it so that you expand your reasoning power and make it more general. The more general your understanding, the, the better ability you have to apply uh, the actual work. And, and that's why, when, when I teach, I have to think about, well, what do my students know? And then focus on the concepts that you know, just like showing that the polar coordinate transformation is one to one with R positive from zero to two pi, thinking, okay, if we have to keep the R positive, um, we can't have the, the sign of, uh, sign of uh, theta one and the sign of theta two being different. Again, as we work through it, we, we use basic trigonometry and say, well, that can't happen. Theta one has to be theta two, otherwise R is negative, which we can't have. So, so, so those types of calculations are, are based upon what you know. And that's the, that's the art of, of teaching a particular class, keeping your audience in mind. But that doesn't mean it's simple because you have to use everything. It's like you use everything, including uh, the kitchen sink, so to speak. So now, Let's go back to our friend, the Taurus, and use some polar coordinates. So this example we've seen before, but now it's, it's paraded to us in WebAssign with a polar coordinate uh, spin. So it says revolve, this is a nice example for the uh, surface area, revolve the circle, and we will assume, ladies and gentlemen, that A is a positive number. Revolve the circle R equal four A. So that's just a circle centered at the origin of radius four A because theta is free about the line R equals five B secant theta, where and this is important, uh, 4b or 4a is less than 5b. So, so these are bigger. So when we do the vertical line, the, the, the circles to the left of the vertical line, just to, just to make the computation doable. And then it says compute area of the resulting torus.
to the tourist, the, the donut, so to speak. Now, notice, and this is, this is kind of interesting when you think about it, um, when you just divide by secant, they, they, Weber signs trying to you know, pull the wool over your eyes, like, oh, this is real difficult. This is not difficult at all. If notice here, if you just divide by secant, we have R and one over secant's cosine, right? We have R cosine theta, which is equal to X equals 5B. That's the vertical line that's described in terms of polar coordinates. So this is the vertical line. Okay, so they were being honest with you. They're just kind of making it look a little bit more uh, complicated, but it's not. Okay, so now, now we're thinking maybe just a nice little diagram of this like we've done before would be useful. So we can draw our circle and then get our distance to the axis of revolution. Of course, we have to change things up a little bit because the axis of revolution has been translated to the right. So we have our 4A. Yeah, so I always have to, to get this get this circle here, I always have to rotate it a little bit. There we go. Get a better circle. So that's 4A right there. And now, so of course we'll use symmetry because that's our that's what we do. So by hypothesis, 5B is, is larger than 4A. So this will be X equals 5B. And so now we have an element of arc length here. And do we just want the distance, again, for some theta? This is our theta here. And this distance is to the distance to the, the this particular distance is the distance from the element of arc length to the axis of revolution. And so now, of course, here, notice, this is just 4a cosine theta, just basic trigonometry. So this distance will just be 5b minus 4a cosine theta. So that's distance to the axis of revolution. And this is what we're doing. So, so again, we just have to make a small adjustment to this formula because now the, the, the theta equal pi over two axis has been translated. So we can compute the area of the torus with this setup uh, because we now have the, uh, the knowledge of the polar coordinates. So this implies area of torus. You like differential geometry. Some of you will eventually take it. It's a fun class. So now, of course, we'll be cheap again. I won't be too cheap. I'll make it simple. Let's do this. Sometimes simple is better. Let's just go ahead and integrate from zero to pi and double the result. So use symmetry. Use symmetry, double result. So now if you look at this, we'll have the symmetry part doubling the result, the two pi from the uh, formula. And then of course, zero to pi. And then of course we have distance to the axis of revolution, which is this guy, 5B minus 4A cosine theta. And now you're thinking, hallelujah. I've, I've just, I haven't said anything about this. You're like, well, Professor Ron, you're writing this formula down. What about the element of arc length? You, don't you do that first? You know, the last problem, it was, it was a nightmare, all that calculation. Well, look at this, everybody. This is a constant. So 
R equals 4A. So I just kind of laid back with this and thought I'd just, you know, spring it on you. Of course, R prime is just zero. So, so that's like happy days. I mean, we're thinking, yeah, I'll take that any day. So now the element, this implies the element of arc length is just the square root of what? 4A squared d theta. But that's just 4A d theta because the absolute value of 4A is just 4A because so, A is positive. So, so that was like, that was like really good. So we get what? 4A d theta and we'll take it. So we see simplification here. We see simplification knowing the, uh, knowing the uh, polar coordinate system, at least attacking it this way. And then we see the result is truly simpler, but we had to pay the price, right? So now of course we have the four A, which is a constant and we have the four pi. So we have four pi times four A. We have the integral zero to pi of, 5b minus 4a cosine theta d theta. Okay, these are easy integrals. So we get now, what do we have? What, 16 pi times a. And so of course, this will be a 5b theta. And then of course, the antiderivative of cosine is the positive sign. So we get minus 4a sine theta. So nice, easy integrals. The integrals we've done today have been easy. They haven't been complicated. I mean, just reduction formula, add one, divide by the new power, you know, fairly straightforward. So now we have 16 pi A. Now we can substitute uh, pi for theta. So we have 5B times pi minus, well, I'll use a bracket here, uh, minus 4A sine of theta, which is pi. And then of course minus, and then of course when theta is zero, we just get a zero here, uh, minus 4a sine of zero. So what does this do for us? Well, now this will give us a 16 pi a, and then we've got what? We've got a 5b times pi, this of course is zero because sine of pi is zero. And of course this is zero because sine of zero is zero. So we just get what? Uh, a five pi b. So now of course the 30 and then the three, that'll give us an 80 pi squared. So we always get this pi squared with the area of the uh, uh, torus times the AB. So that kind of looks like the uh, area of an ellipse. So these start to recur over and over. They, they become repetitive. But what we can see here is that, that the, the polar coordinate uh, setup here is not, is not too bad. It's actually very straightforward and it's something that we can compute just with our basic knowledge when we extend the uh, area of a surface of revolution uh, to our polar coordinate form. Now, what I wanted to do was do some examples, more examples having to do with area and also some intersection of curves. The thing, the thing about the polar coordinate transformation in general is that it's, it's a little bit deceptive at times um, because of the pole. So, so you're like, you know, how do, I, how do I make sure I cover everything? So let me do an example here of an area. Uh, we remember last class, we talked about circles on the polar axis and circles on the uh, pi over two axis. And so we want to consider an area problem with these types of, of, of shapes. So the, the circles and the lemniscates, the figure eight, of course, that has all the issues at the, at the origin. But I mean, you know, if anyone says, you know, the figure eight is, is, is easy, it, 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 you, can, you can say, well, here, here's a way to 
produce a figure eight mathematically, just give them the polar coordinate form and, and, and impress your friends. So now here's an example. So we have two circles. That is, we want to compute, and this has a lot of nice, nice ideas in it that'll help me to push forward what I was saying. Compute the common area Um, compute the common area of the circles. And what we have here is, let's see, A is going to be positive, And we have the circle R equal A cosine theta and R equal A sine theta. So that, those are the circles I just talked about. So first, uh, what we can do is, and this, this is kind of important. Remember, if, if, you have a, if you have an intersection with the pole, the, the thetas may not align from the curves. And so intersections of curves at the pole are, are kind of beyond the algebra of the situation. So first, let's just notice here, uh, let's just set R equal to zero. So in, in, we'll call this, circle one and this circle two. So for number one, when R equals zero, is that possible? Well, of course it is. So this just says cosine theta equals zero. So this would say theta is equal to the inverse cosine of zero. And we know that the one true value is pi over two. And of course there are others and we can extend just odd multiples of pi over two. So the extension would just be, but this will be sufficient for our work. Uh, theta would just be uh, pi over two times two k plus one, all possibles for the infinitely many solutions. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that this curve is actually zero when theta is pi over two. Let's look at this one, r equals zero, if and only if, um, sine theta equals zero. So that says theta is the inverse sine, good old inverse trig functions of zero, which is uh, zero. So if we wanted all solutions, we would just say uh, pi uh, times k, as long as we're on the polar axis. So notice here, we have, we have intersection, that is these curves pass through the pole but at different values of theta. And so you don't, see, you don't see these if you're like solving simultaneous equations, you don't see this. So this is something you have to kind of address as a separate case. That's just the nuance of the, of the polar equations. So we would say, in, in, we don't just forget things, but we see that, that uh, for theta equals zero, r is zero, and for theta, here equal pi over two, r is zero. So we just kind of cheat and say, they both pass through the pole. So we'll say intersection, intersection point. This is kind of to the side, zero, zero. That is r is zero and theta is zero, even though we're cheating a little bit, we know that they pass through the pole. So both, both curves, pass through the pole. And you don't see that if you don't think about it this way. So that's a, that's a little kink with the polar coordinates. So, so if you've got a problem where they say, okay, where do these curves intersect? And you don't address this, you'll be like, you get that big old red X that says, well, wrong. And you're like, oh, well, I, I solved the equations. What's wrong with this problem? Well, it's like my student who, who did a, a, a test, last test, and didn't submit any answers. And I said, why didn't you submit your answers? Oh, I don't know. I'm thinking, okay, don't do things like that. If you, if you want to set yourself up for success, you, you follow the rules. So remember, remember, polar coordinates, polar coordinates are a little bit quirky. They're very useful, but they're a little bit quirky. So this is one thing we have to address.
Now, of course, we can say, well, let's just set them equal. Also, we'll have A cosine theta equals sine theta, A sine theta. And then, of course, the A's absorb, and we just have sine theta minus cosine theta equals zero. Now, of course, you look at this and just say, well, that's just, you know, pi over four kind of thing. But but we can we can treat this as the uh, uh, special equation that we had before just to review this because this is important. We can say A equals one and B equals negative one. So A squared plus B squared is two. And then of course, tangent, we used phi here, tangent phi is B over A. So that's negative one if and only if uh, phi will be the negative of the inverse tangent of one, which is negative pi over four. And now when you, when you look at this, you think, okay, so this implies that we have sine theta, just to review this minus cosine theta equals, so the square root of two times sine theta minus, minus pi over four. So this, this replaces this, this nice little identity we have equals zero. So this is a more generalized way to solve this that I teach my pre-cal kids. And of course we use this back when we were doing integrals. Remember, it looked like this, a sine x plus b cosine x equals a squared plus b squared square root sine of x plus phi, where tangent of phi is equal to b over a. Okay, and so I do I do that and then solve this. So this is what we're using. So this is always good to know when you're looking for all of the solutions. So now when you when you look at this, this will say, well, if and only if the square root of two goes away and we just have theta minus pi over four equals inverse sine of zero. So now we're back, we're back to this right here. So looking at all solutions, this would just be theta equals pi over four plus pi k. Okay? So when k was equal to zero, we get pi over four, which you were already thinking about. So for instance, a good solution will be theta equal pi over four. So that's where we expect these circles to actually intersect away from the pole. And then of course you could add uh, multiples of pi and get other intersections because we know that circles will be traced and retraced and retraced because of their uh, trigonometric uh, renderings. So again, this is, this is a type of analysis that you need to do. Now, of course, sometimes when you're quick going really fast and you say, we all, I know these are equal when I get power before, so if that's enough for the problem, I'm fine. But I wanted to take an opportunity to review this. So now, now we can see what really is going on. And then you're thinking, well, how do I get the area common to both? Well, we just use the area formula but we have to look at it like we did the other curves. So for instance, say we've got the, the A over two, and then of course all the way out to A, right? So we just get a little Rembrandt, right? well not Rembrandt, I'm being silly. So let's see here. So this would be, um, this one is R equals A cosine theta. And then of course, the other one here, the sine is right here. Oh, sorry, kids, I need to connect it this way.
Okay, so this is what you were thinking with this problem. That is, you see this radial distance pi over four here that cuts this common area in half. But even if you didn't notice that, it wouldn't matter. You could still get the problem correct. The, the idea is we, we want to be lazy here. We don't want to work so hard. So by the symmetry, we can at least exploit that. And then you're thinking, okay, what about the other circle? Well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the blue line here. So this piece here is R equal A cosine theta. This piece right here is the other curve, R equal A sine theta. And so the common area here is this part right here, which is cut in half by theta equal pi over two or pi over four. But now notice this common intersection point zero zero, you don't get from this. This solving these equations will never give you that point. We had to do this as a second case. So that's the what I was talking about, polar coordinates. You're not going to see that from here. You only see it when you do this. So we have that. So you're thinking we can do this two ways. We can see at this point that, that we could integrate and do the radial area here moving out this way for the cosine curve, pi over four to pi over two. Or we could use the sine curve and integrate zero to pi over four and get the same result and double it. So, so the, the, the thing is when you have intersecting curves, you wanna be able to think about symmetry and think about how this radial definition of area makes sense. And most students never get this. This just, just doesn't compute for some reason. So that's why I'm taking the time to go through this and, and now have you look at this from a more analytic standpoint. So now by symmetry, that is, let me write this in the red, use symmetry and double result. Use symmetry, and I'm sorry that symmetry didn't come out very well, did it? Let me rewrite that. Use symmetry and double result. So this kind of gives you a nice working knowledge of this. So when you see these, you know what to do. So let's just kind of live on the edge and say, okay, let's use the, let's just use the cosine curve. And, and so we'll say use R equal A cosine theta. The curve right here, running from here, and then we'll think of the radial lines running that way where theta runs from pi over four down to pi over two. So here we've got the theta equal pi over two. So we've got our radial lines moving from here all the way to here, the radii running this way on this interval. And so now area, let me write it as common area using our symmetry, common area equals twice. So we'll have one half integral pi over four to pi over two. This is a nice calculation. And then we square R. So that gives us a squared cosine squared theta d theta. Again, not a very difficult integral, but now hopefully you're seeing how we use symmetry and we're using the radial definition with the trigonometric equations to, to find the right intersection. So when you're talking about two curves, you always need to address the poles separately, okay? That's important. So now we're good to go. The two's absorb and we can factor the a squared. So now this will give us pi over four. I'm not trying to do a line integral, the old notation, a closed integral. You put a little circle there, but I don't need to write that. And so the cosine squared, we can write as one half, one, plus cosine two theta using the reduction formula, right? 
So that's how we address these because we want to get a quick answer. So this gives us a squared over two, and now we can integrate and pay for the two here. So we get what? Theta. And then plus, now here the antiderivative of uh, cosine is the positive sign, but we need the one half. So this will be plus one half sine two theta. Again, here, chain rule. So we're going back to our, our friends uh, from the very first problem. Pi over four to pi over two. I think in the lecture notes, I actually did zero to pi over four, but I wanted to add more detail here to kind of keep everybody thinking correctly. So now we can finish this off. So this will be a squared over two and we'll evaluate it pi over two. So we get pi over two plus one half sine. Okay, two, in this case, uh, two times pi over two, that's just gonna be pi minus, and now we have uh, pi over four plus one half sine and now we've got two theta, so the two will absorb here and we just get sine of pi over two. Close that, like you all do in web assign, right? So we have a squared over two. And so now we have pi over two minus pi over four. So we'll just say two pi over four minus pi over four. Take care of these guys. And then of course, the uh, sine of pi, this is zero. It's like we're doing Fourier analysis. You'll enjoy that when you get the PDEs, it's fun stuff. And then of course here, this is sine of pi over two, which is one, so we get one half minus a one half. So this will give us, if you will, a squared over two. And now we just get what pi over four, two minus one, minus one half. And then of course you can leave it like this or you can just multiply it out or factor the common denominator. It doesn't matter. I don't think it really matters. So we get what uh, a squared times the pi divided by eight and then minus a squared over four. How you write it doesn't matter. WebAssign doesn't care. My, my students are still amazed that you can write square root of five plus square root of one half divided by square root of three in WebAssign and then they'll take it. I said, WebAssign just wants an equivalent answer. Um, don't worry about making it look beautiful. That, that's more than sufficient. So, so what we're seeing with this example is that we have a more general result. That is, you can change the A out to anything and you have the answer here. But what I wanted to point out is that the additional, the additional work you need to do to check the poll separately, do that separately. And, and then of course, that means you're probably gonna get different values of theta, but then just say the intersection point is the pole, zero, zero. So you just kind of ignore you, you see that they both do intersect the pole and then you just go right to that point right there. And that's where you might be wanting to say, well, do I put, do I put pi or do I put zero? Well, no, you just put that point because that defines the pole in, in the, the simplest way. So, so again, think about common areas utilizing the way we configure area. Now, there's one other example here. So this is a good example. These all, all these examples have been set up to give you good review and a more thorough understanding of polar coordinates. This usually gets just shoved away, like swept under the rug. It doesn't even get covered a lot of times in calculus too, because there's lack of time. But this is important stuff. When you get to Cal 3, this will be very useful to you. Now, there's one other example here that I wanted to allude to that I was talking about. 
that's interesting. And this is just another intersection problem. So when you look at this, for instance, here's just a problem that says compute intersections. And it's the same thing I've done before, but I've, it's one more example from the web assignment that I think you'll enjoy. Compute intersections. So first we have, it looks like we've got some limasons. We have one plus cosine theta. This is repetitive, but it's an important repetition. Okay, so we have these two curves and we want to compute intersections. So first what we'll just do is say, can they be zero? Well, they can be. So we'll just say R, call this one and call this two. So we have R equals zero if and only if cosine theta. And in this, in this problem, here's what they specify so you don't write all day. We want R positive and we want theta to live between zero and two pi. So web assign says, don't give me everything, just give me that. Okay, so now of course, this would just say that uh, cosine theta equals negative one, if and only if theta is equal to the inverse cosine of what, negative one, and that's pi. Now, of course, if we if we look at this and say, okay, well, this is zero, done. Don't don't say anymore. We know it can be zero, so done. R equals zero. Is this possible? Of course. Uh, this says sine theta equals one, if and only if theta is equal to the inverse sine of one, which is pi over two. It doesn't matter. These are different values of the angle. But what this basically says is that these curves intersect the pole. So this implies an intersection point zero, zero, just like we had before. So forget that and just say they both intersect the pole. And this is what I'm talking about. They can be zero, but they don't, the angles don't correspond, but that's just the quirkiness. And then you're thinking, okay, what about the other one? So let's set them equal. We'll do the same thing we did before. So these are equal, so one plus cosine theta equals one minus sine theta. If and only if, now we've just got what? Sine theta, just take the sine theta over, sine theta plus cosine theta equals zero. Now, of course, we can do this quickly. We have A equals one, B equals one, that's our power over four friend. So this will be equivalent to square root two sine of theta now plus pi over four because we've got plus one equals zero. If and only if now we've got what? Um, theta plus pi over four equals in this case, the inverse sine of zero. Now we want to go ahead and write down all solutions. These will just be pi k. So equivalently, we know this is zero, but let's write down all theta plus pi over four equals pi k. If and only if theta is equal to negative pi over four plus pi k. Okay, well, negative is not going to work, so we'll just kind of iterate this. So we have k equals 1, so that'll be negative pi over 4 plus pi, so that gives us theta equals 3 pi over 4. That's a good one because that lives here. And then we have k equals 2, so that'll be a 2 pi, which is an 8 pi over 4 minus pi over 4, so we get what? 7 pi over 4. That's a good one. But any larger is too big. So, so we've got this intersection point and then we have to figure out what these are. So now we're done, let's just pick one. So we have R of three pi over four equals, we'll just, we'll use this one. This will be one plus cosine of three pi over four. So that's one minus the square root, uh, or what is that, uh, one over root two? 
<laughs> that's funny when you think about these unit circle again the second quadrant how funny now and then of course r of seven pi over four this will be one reference angle again is pi over four but this is in the fourth quadrant cosine seven pi over four will give us one plus one over root two. Now this is this is what you're used to doing here. This is what you're not used to doing. So now when you have points of intersection, points of intersection, we have the pole, which is that kind of quirky one that, that we do very differently as a special case. And then we have what? Uh, r one minus one root two, three pi over four, and r one plus one over root two, seven pi over four. Now, again, this is, this is like trigonometry, but it's, it's masked in the, the subject of polar coordinates. So, so again, when you're talking about polar equations intersecting, the pole has to be a separate calculation. And then you can look for others that make more sense to you. And of course you can sketch these, but this will cover, if you, if you do the, the full calculation here, this will cover all the bases, so to speak. And then you can just start iterating until you just get too large and then you stop, just like you did in pre-cal. So, so the nice thing about the polar coordinates is that it gives you a way to get back into the trig uh, in a little bit different way that will help uh, prepare you for uh, calculus three when you do cylindrical and spherical coordinates. There's a lot of trig in Cal three. It's, it's a very different course from Cal two, but you will enjoy it. So uh, what I'll do, like I said, I will get up an announcement about the final. And uh, I, I do think we will meet uh, on Monday of next week. Uh, we won't meet on Wednesday. You'll be taking your test, but I'll probably have some uh, uh, moments to, to do some review exercises. There's a practice test and just go over uh, uh, some items that will be good for review. Again, like I said before at the beginning of the uh, lecture, be sure to cover the new material and then go back and highlight things where there might be some rustiness. You all spend a lot of time with the series, so I, you feel good about that, uh, but that might be something you want to review anyway. And then of course, uh, the integrals and the things and the, uh, the applications and all uh, that we've done. Uh, we, we really think, think about this class as like integration techniques, series, and then what, parametrics. That's kind of like the three big categories. And so spend some time on this to develop some comfort. And if I don't see you at the office hours, uh, look forward to the uh, message about the uh, uh, final and, and I, will, I will see you at our next lecture. So keep, keep the engine running. Again, get enough sleep, uh, drink plenty of water. Don't, don't eat stuff that you know, you're not sure about. I don't want you to get a stomach bug or whatever that's the high stress can can bring that on. I have some students who are sick with that. So be careful about that. Don't, don't abuse yourself when, when, when you just eat things and you're just not picky about what you eat. Your body is in, in a stressful state right now and I don't want anyone to get sick. Okay, so thank you for your attention today. I hope you've enjoyed our little journey into the polar coordinates and parametric. It's always fun. And, and this will serve you well when you get to calculus three. So stay well, and, and I look forward to hearing from you, and, and good luck as you study. Talk to you later.